Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Utica. My name is Kim Bywater, and I'm a member of the worship committee. Here in this place, all are welcome. All means all. Whoever you love, whoever you are, wherever you come from, whatever your station in life, whatever faith traditions you have, if any, you are welcome here. With reverence, we recognize that we are standing on the ancestral ground of the Haudenosaunee people. It is with gratitude that we gather together in this welcoming space. If you are visiting us today for the first time, either in person or online, we are glad you have joined us. We would love to learn more about you and connect you with, your, with our newsletter, if you like. Our title for today's service is the Avaduta Gita of Datatreya. And I am honored to introduce our guest speaker for today, Reverend Janet Stemmer. Janet is a former member of UUU and a retired CPA. She was ordained as an interfaith, interspiritual minister by One Spirit Interfaith Seminary in 2015 after many years of spiritual study. She leads a weekly Muji Sangha group, which you are invited. If interested, please speak to Reverend Janet after the service. And she also volunteers as assistant chaplain at Upstate Medical in Syracuse. We have three announcements. I would like to ask Ken Drake to come up for the first. Good morning. I coordinate the Social Justice Council here at uh, UU Utica. I have two announcements. First, I will be available after service this morning to talk with anyone who might be interested in joining an expository writing group. Secondly, please notice the bulletin board of social justice initiatives in the main hallway across from the restrooms. Special thanks to Jocelyn Eastman, our church office secretary, for her help in putting this board together. Thank you. And John Camilleri has an announcement. Good morning. Uh, I'm, I'm the uh, coordinator of Soul Matters Small Group Ministry. We have groups starting um, next month, April through June. Uh, we, meet, we meet once a month um, and we have uh, spots available on the second Sunday um, of the month, which we will meet in the church after service. We also have spots open in our Zoom group, which is the second Thursday of the month. There's a brief article in the newsletter with links to more information. Uh, my email is on there. Feel free to contact me, or you can see me at, after the service. Thank you. And finally, an update on stewardship from Jack Pendrack. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, the stewardship drive is doing very well so far. We are, as of this morning, a little over $70,000 um, with uh, approximately uh, 38 or 39 people um, pledging. So we still have you know, another 30 or so um, pledges out there. So we have a very good chance of uh, uh, reaching or at least coming very close to our goal of $94,000. So thank you, everyone. If someone hasn't pledged, you can see me or, you know, do a pledge card uh, during the service if you want. Or there's links in the uh, newsletter, um, which you can click on and do a pledge electronically. Um, but in any case, um, thank you very much. I'd also like to point out that our, our committee, uh, mostly uh, uh, with Barb Freeman and also with uh, uh, a lot of help from, uh, uh, from Jocelyn Eastman, our church secretary, um, we've made a little pamphlet um, titled Pledging Matters that we're going to have um, 
in the sanctuary all year long so that people um, new to the church or if they have any questions about pledging um, uh, or stewardship, where the money goes, that sort of thing, it's going to be available. Uh, so, you know, feel free um, to pick one up if you're interested. Thank you. First off, thank you so much for inviting me to come visit. I always enjoy a trip from Syracuse, especially when the sun is shining and the snow is bright white. It was a beautiful day today coming down. Back in 1985, when I was backpacking, I discovered in red my first Indian classic, the Bhagavad Gita, and I thought, the Gita, like the Bible, that's the one. And Gita means song. And fast forward to this very place, when I think it was like maybe 2015, I didn't look it up, uh, we had a Hindu priest come and speak and he talked about the Gitas. <gasps> Gitas, there's more than one. And since then, I've had the opportunity to become more acquainted with them. Uh, I study with the teacher Muji and he reads from the Bhagavad Gita and the Ashtavakra Gita and the Avaduta Gita. But upon reading and digesting them, I realized there are many current teachers presenting the same idea, but I didn't get it until I went through that. Kind of like when you buy a red car and now you see red cars everywhere. I go, oh, he's saying that same thing. He's saying the same thing. So today is not so much about the Gita, although it starts from there, but it talks about all the way, ways, all the people that I hear saying these same things, these same ideas, that same realization spans the ages this is the gitas are thousands of years old written down maybe a thousand years ago but, but certainly their origins are much long much deeper but there are people today that are having the same experience the same realization the same understanding and so i wanted to present as much of that as, as well starting i'm going to start with eckhart tolle with our cellist lighting the cellist lighting says this quote from Eckhart Tolle, you are the universe expressing itself as a human for a little while. Think about that. I am the universe expressing itself as a human for a little while. Be my new mantra. So let's start with hymn number 1024 and in him it's in the teal hymnal she has some instructions on that okay 1024 we are going to do the verses starting with the word do and then sing and then dance and finally we're going back to do so four verses
and not on your order of service, was my children's book, which I brought, which is I Am Always I by Rupert Spira, another teacher of these ideas, Rupert Spira, right? It says in the, in the introduction for Rupert Spira, he said he felt as a child that there was an untouchable peace in him surrounded by things that change over time. My body changes, where I live changes, the weather changes, yet something, something in me remains the same. And you have a sense of that. I am, I am. Who told you I am? Do you know that you are? That there's something that exists here? The Avaduta Gita is called the song of the free soul, the liberated soul, and it describes what is seen from that perspective of the free soul. It is one of several scriptures that came out of India that expresses the understanding of non-dualism, not two, but one. The Avadut says, I am that pure, bodiless, unborn, imperishable, unchanging reality, a lot of words. I am that pure, bodyless, no body, unborn, imperishable, unchanging reality. What is unchanging in us? What can that mean? And that's the problem. The brain wants to know, what is that? What is that? It wants a concept. It wants an explanation. It wants the encyclopedia on what does that mean? And the issue is, it is not a concept. It's not a belief. It's an experience. It's a presence. It's a knowing. Can somebody tell you you don't exist? It's an awareness. And it's not limited to a yogi who lived a thousand or more years ago. This is possible for each of us. And I think we are living in a time when it is more possible. Sometimes it seems, one of my teachers used to say, we're out here with fire hoses, pouring it, and you're walking around these little teacups. Open up, let it in. And I see the door opening for many in the Muji group, that, you know, as you're spending time studying these ideas and becoming these ideas. The Avadut says, how can I say that the unchanging reality is not this or not that, that is endless or has an end? I am boundless as space. You might think of the sky. Where is the beginning of the sky? Where is the end of the sky? Is it just out there? Is it in here? Is air in here or out there? Where is air? It's not out there, and yet it is out there and in here and everywhere. When you take away the layers, the labels, the concepts of who we think we are, the woman, the daughter, the accountant, the chaplain, the sister, the friend, the happy person, a sad person, a person, a body, what's left? Can we find that unchanging reality? I am. How do you find what you already are? Byron Katie has a wonderful exercise, another one of who has, has this understanding, has an exercise that said, who would you be without, you name it, this trauma, this identity, this sadness, this illness, things we identify with, which become the center of our life. Who would you be without this? Take all that away, who is that? Can you disconnect from it? And Rupert Spears' book, the little girl says, I cannot be anything. I am always I. All this changes, but here, I am always I. The Avadut says, you are that pure, bodiless, unborn, imperishable, unchanging reality. That which existed before your body. That which will exist after your body. And again, Eckhart Tolle said, you are the universe, expressing itself as a human for a little while. 
It's not a theory. It's not a philosophy. It's an experience, an awareness, your true nature, who you actually are. I stepped into the elevator at a hospital. And I had been reading this from Eckhart Tolle. And I stepped in the elevator. Instead of seeing three people in an elevator, I saw the universe expressing itself as a doctor, as a therapist, as a visitor, even the one looking. Like a wave forming in the ocean, it rises and falls. We come into being from that unchanging reality, crest like a wave, and subside back into the one. Never being separated from the one, but pretending for a short while to be a separate person. But in truth, we're not a bunch of separate beings floundering in chaos. That is what's going on out here. Underneath, if there is an underneath or behind, there is a unity, a connectedness, a oneness. If you can stop your mind from interfering, because the oneness is here in the heart, not up here in the head. If you can stop your mind from interfering, you might look out and see that it is so. You might have this moment, wow, to see. It's like taking off your virtual reality goggles and stepping into a bigger world. Wow. But no mind, <laughs> how to do that? When you try to stop your mind to meditate, how successful are you? Maybe not stop, but ignore. How many have the TV on at home, but don't pay attention to it? We know how to ignore. What if you did the same thing to your thoughts? If you don't feed your thoughts, they become less intrusive. But if you chase every thought that arises, well, you're going to be very busy. And we tend to do that. The Avadut said, I am beyond all forms. Your thoughts are forms. Is beyond that, beyond the thoughts. The thoughts are just the goggles through which you see a separate world. And he's not just speaking for himself, he is speaking from that experience that we are capable of having. Eckhart Tolle speaks about when he had his first experience of that. He awoke in the night, he'd been very depressed, he was thinking, what was the point in continuing to live with this burden of misery? Why carry on with this continuous struggle? I could feel a deep longing for annihilation, he says, for non-existence. It was now becoming much stronger than the desire to live. I cannot live with myself any longer. I cannot live with myself any longer. This was the thought that kept repeating. And suddenly he said, I became aware of what a peculiar thought that is. I cannot live with myself any longer. Am I one or two? If I cannot live with myself, there must be two of me. The I and the self that I cannot live with. Maybe, I thought, only one of them is real. I was so stunned by the strange realization, he writes, that my mind stopped. I was fully conscious and there were no more thoughts. He continues, the, the intense pressure of suffering that night must have forced my consciousness to withdraw from its identification with the unhappy and deeply fearful self, which he says is ultimately a fiction of the mind. This withdrawal must have been so complete that this false suffering self immediately collapsed, just as if a plug had been pulled out of a toy. What was left then, he says, was my true nature as the ever-present I am. Consciousness in its pure state prior to identification with form. How many have had an experience of unity I think runners sometimes go into the sudden space. This feeling of unity being in nature, being connected to everything suddenly, walk into a McDonald's and everything is God. It can happen. It happened to me. <laughs> You're kidding me, right? You know, God has a great sense of humor. Really, my Hamburg, that old guy over there, that little girl over there, everything is God. Okay. 
And it, you know, it doesn't go into words very well, these experiences. We find it too in the Christian world. This isn't just Hindu world or my weird world or I love in the Christian world, the words of Teresa of Avila. When she says Christ, which I see as her word for the imperishable being, Christ prays in me, works in me, looks through my eyes, speaks through my words, works through my hands, walks with my feet and loves with my heart. She is no longer Teresa. There is only the imperishable being. She no longer identifies with labels of woman, daughter, Teresa. She has had that experience of all that falling away. I cannot be anything. I am the universe expressing itself as a human. What an extraordinary thing. The Avadut says when Brahman, God, universe, spirit, whatever your word is, God in many names, when God is omnipresent, luminous, motionless, I do not see any diversity. How can it be inside or outside? Where is it, the mind says. Where is it? The ego wants it to be a thing it can study, can observe, can explain. But the Avadut says it is not inside or outside. It's like asking where is air, inside or outside, beginning where, ending where. This unity exists in all of us, as all of us, and we exist in it like that drop in the ocean. But this overdeveloped mind is always looking outside for answers. Happiness is out there. Oh, yes, let's see. To help you remember, to help you remember. here we go. I'm looking out there. <laughs> It's out there, it's out there. You can just feel the energy going out, 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 right? You gotta remember that? <laughs> Create a moment for you. Happiness is out there, purpose is out there, love is out there. I had a friend, friend uh, many years ago, we used to challenge each other on whether what we said was true, and he said, you know, you cannot say I love you, because there's no I, and there's no you. There's only love. But it's not out there, it's in here. Another sage from India, Nisargadatta Maharaj said, when I look outside and see that I am everything, that is love. He's not talking about a belief of being everything, a concept of being everything, but a seeing that he is everythingness. He says, being afraid of being the, being the world, I am not afraid of the world. Like this hand is not afraid of that hand. What am I to be afraid of? Water is not afraid of water, fire of fire. It's attachment to a name and a shape that begins to breed fear. But how do you even talk about such a seeing? In my life, there have been times when what was experienced could not be put into words. And I'm sure others, I know others have, but they always come back and point to this unity, this truth. And it really doesn't have any words. Maybe you can feel in your heart this is true, or maybe you remember a moment. When you knew something you shouldn't know you knew. My sister did a diagnosis one time. She said, I don't know where that came from. We, we run deeper than we think. A Course in Miracles points to all this. I love lesson number three of start to write off. I do not understand anything I see. <laughs> Good place to start. Just, then you get up to 95. I am one self united with my creator. Well, there's still a little tunis there. Less than 97, I am spirit. I am. But your mind will argue this can't be true. I can see my hand and things. It, will, it's got, it must be this. To develop the seeing means sitting quietly, letting the dust settle. When the jar is shaken and it's all muddy, you can't see anything. And that's kind of how we tend to live. We stop, be quiet. But the mind says, you gotta go to the store. You gotta run the laundry. What's for dinner? No, not right now. I gotta call my friend. Oh, feed the cat? I don't have time right now. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh says, um, meditate for 20 minutes. And if you don't have time, meditate for 40. This addiction, and it's an, it's an addiction we have with a mind always running. 
and our social media, our phones feed into what's next, what's next, what's going on in the world, da, da, da. It's like an alcoholic always looking for the next drink. At least initially, when we sit down, it's still, the wheels are still running, but Muji says, don't get discouraged. The fact that you sit down is step one. Keep going. It's stated that the Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree for 49 days before it fell away. And they say 49 is a symbolic number, so who knows what it really was. I couldn't find the story, but I think it was Papaji Papa when told by his teacher that if he sat in quiet, he would find the answer. And he went and did just that. He sat until it fell away. As mind quiets down through repetition, perseverance, sitting in quiet, ignoring thoughts, you learn to anchor in that deep silence. It doesn't mean spend your whole day in silence. Sometimes, sometimes that's not a bad idea. The mind has a role, but it's not supposed to be in charge. Adi Ashanti, another teacher who has dropped the person identity, says, the only thing that covers up our true nature is our grasping, our aversion, and our belief in the mind. We're always running towards something, away from something. Byron Katie said, if you want real control, drop the illusion of control. Let life have you. It does anyway. <laughs> the mind projects this belief of you controlling the environment. You got to keep that mind engaged to keep in control. We had eight inches of snow or 10 or whatever you had yesterday. Do you really think you're in control? <laughs> Let life have you. Relax the running to and fro. You will find that when you are anchored in the silence, a path arises before you. You walk that path and what is to be done unfolds. If we try to control, struggle arises. If there's fear, question what fear is trying to protect. Adyashanti again says, when you get out of the driver's seat, you find that life can drive itself. That actually life has always been driving itself. When you get out of the driver's seat, it can drive itself so much easier. It can flow in ways you never imagined. Life becomes almost magical. The illusion of the me is no longer in the way. Life begins to flow, and you never know where it will take you. Returning to the Avaduti says, I have never done anything. Because there is not an identity, a person that takes credit for what happens. And nothing happens in the unchanging reality. Papa G's book is titled, Nothing Ever Happened. I think there's three volumes of Nothing Ever Happened. <laughs> Reminds me that, again, you know, I see it everywhere. Another red car, my, the Tao De Ching. The Tao does nothing, yet leaves nothing undone. When there is silence, one finds the anchor within oneself. But then the mind says, yes, but who's going to fix, fix the world? We can't just sit around and do nothing. Well, this is not doing nothing. But if the surgeon starts operating before he learns his subject, where are we? Once the din of constant thoughts subsides, we become aware of what is ours to do, and then we do it. But if we just run around like hair on fire, how can that create peace? The Dalai Lama said, and I, this is such an amazing statement, if every eight-year-old in the world is taught meditation, we will eliminate violence from the world in one generation. Because they're operating from here. If every eight-year-old in the world is taught meditation, we will eliminate violence from the world in one generation. It's that important. It changes your life. Consider beginning and ending your day in silence. 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 40 minutes. Let it be your North Star this and gradually or suddenly the clouds recede i pray it may be so for all of you blessed be amen yeah everybody take a deep breath that's a lot of information our next is our hymn, number 352, in the, the, gray, the gray book, the gray hymnal, Find a Stillness.
settle in for a moment. Rest in your chairs. Close your eyes. Just take a moment and send good thoughts to those who are struggling. But then let's take a step for a moment, for a few minutes. Let us drop all thoughts about the past. Let's stop our thinking, ignore our thinking. Leave aside the memories. Let your thoughts about what I'm gonna do later today or tomorrow or whenever, let that drop away. Just sink into your heart, just for a few minutes. No one's gonna miss you for a few minutes. You don't need all that planning right now. Just sink into some silence. Be empty. Just be in this present moment. No thinking who you are, why I'm doing this. Let it all slide away just for a few minutes. You can pick them up later. Don't be wondering about what's next. Drop it, drop it. Just let it slide away, all those thoughts. Don't be plugging into your body and your senses. Just leave them all alone. Just be empty, be empty. Let the names and the places and the person drop away. Just feel yourself that you exist in your heart. Be aware of what remains when all that goes away. No names, no thoughts, just empty, just being. Don't create anything, just be empty. Just spend a moment here, a little vacation. Drop the thoughts, ignore the thoughts be in your heart. Your heart's not apart from you. You are that. Just be in your heart, resting, resting. It's not a belief, it's a knowing. I know that I am. Just rest in that for one moment. Take a breath. Just let it all go for a moment. I can be without you for one moment. Be quiet, be empty, let it be. Just for this minute, can you feel the quiet? Just let it be quiet. Okay, and then gradually Open your eyes, move in your chair, come back to this room. You can continue to feel connected to that silence. It's always there. You can visit it anytime. Just stay connected to the silence and be looking out at the world. This is something you can do. Peace can be here. Right. Here at church, we give our time, our love, our money, and our energy in service to connecting more deeply with one another and the world beyond these walls. We receive this offering from one another with gratitude for the financial nourishment it provides for our beloved community.
join me in saying the words to extinguishing the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we meet again. May you learn to surrender to the source, to awareness, to silence, and discover who you really are. Amen.